on. Let me do this. Let's get ready. Are you ready? Are we ready? It's Freddy. Man, I'm one handsome beast. Hold me, smile for me, and tell me that you'll never leave, and tell me that you'll never let me go. Leave it. Man, I am some handsome beast, man. Why so handsome, man? All right, we ready? See, when I shave, I look younger, don't I? I am so handsome, man. Why, why are you like this, Ricky? Hold me, smile for me. Tell me. DJ Next, where you been, bro? Where you been? I shaved, so you see? I look like I'm in my late 30s, don't I? Don't hate people. Praise be to our God. Thanks be to our God, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Yeah, I even look leaner, so th thank the Lord. I want to get leaner, that I stay lean, not be vain about it. But before we begin, before we pray, we got a lot to discuss today. Things keep coming up, just to give you an update. Thank you, Ricky. I appreciate you. I don't care what they say about you. Okay, are we ready? There's a lot to discuss, but before we begin, I have to just share some stuff. My life that I need you to pray for. Truth, how you doing, precious sister? Hit the like button. Subscribe, haven't subscribed. Share this on your social media platforms. But <clears throat> you know the rules, right? Full armor. What's up? Vartan, the slayer. You know, what did you think of the articles, D. Reinhardt? You know the rules, right? Please respect the channel. When you disrespect the channel, that means you're being a tool of this devil. I'm going to insult you. I'm going to humiliate you. I'm going to cuss you out and your mother. So respect yourself and your mother and respect the rules. I'm not politically correct. May God make me bold and fearless even unto death. Okay. The rules are you're not going to come here and <clears throat> pontificate, make it your agenda, ask irrelevant questions, chew the fat, and spam or post verses. I don't need your help. Let the Holy Spirit use me. He is the teacher. If he's blessed me, to do ministry, let him use me as his mouthpiece. You can be used of the spirit by doing your own thing, not here. I engage comments because it's a class and I want the spirit to work through me to teach you. So I'm gonna engage to make sure you're getting it. So respect the rules. If you don't, then what that means is you're here because you want me to cuss you out and insult you. And I will, because I have no respect for you because you have no respect for the rules. Let the Holy Spirit be our teacher and we his disciples, right? So. With that said, if you've noticed, I haven't been able to bring on the Oriental Orthodox. It's not their fault. It's my fault. Things are happening. Things are coming up. I've been busy. I've been traveling. I've been trying to get them on. It hasn't happened because of my schedule, because of me leaving, coming back. And now I may have to leave again. So I need your prayers. I'm going to bring them on. They will finish. They have three more sessions, God willing, Lord willing. His will be done, not mine. They have three more sessions. Then, Lord willing, William Albrecht will be coming on to give the Roman Catholic perspective on this issue of miaphysitism versus diaphysitism. Then the Eastern Orthodox are coming. Kai, they'll be coming to present the Eastern Orthodox position. But it's going to be in God's timing. Lord's will be done. Uh, we may plan, but the Lord may have other plans in mind. His will be done. If God gives me health, holiness, and purity and saves me from stumbling, I will serve you by the grace of God. All right. So what's happening now is I've come back. I have a lot of bills I need to catch up to. So pray for provision. Thank the Lord, the accountant that I have. God bless him. Pray he, the Lord will use him. From what he told me, he was able to remove the penalty. The IRS wanted to penalize me $21,000 because it wasn't my fault. Glory to God. I've been told he could remove that and he can reduce what I owe. But I need your prayers. Because that means now I'm going to have to set up a monthly payment plan, which is another extra bill on top of all the things that I have to do. So pray God will provide, save me from this wicked, corrupt judicial legal system. So, but that means April, more taxes. So now I'm going to be indebted till I die because April's coming up and I got to do taxes again. So pray for favor. The Lord protect the money I give to him. It says I use it lawfully. They don't eat it up, and I can use it to take care of my daughters, myself, and to do the work of the Lord, right? 
So please pray for that. So I have a lot of catching up to do. I have to now get car insurance. It's expired. Stuff, it's like it all hits at once. Car insurance. I got to go to the accountant, set up a monthly payment plan, and then pay him for his fees. A lot of stuff, right, Lord willing. Now, on top of that, I found out just yesterday, and I really want to go, a distant relative of my family who was a childhood friend whom I hadn't seen in years. Distant? Yes, I don't take monetization from YouTube for two reasons. Number one, it's okay. Take it easy. Ugh, N75. The guy's asking. <whistles> These ladies, dude. Wow, I thought I was sure you're happy. Okay. N75, please, sister. I know you're a man hater. I know you hate men, but be patient, please. Get stuck for Allah, get stuck for Allah. I know you hate men. Ya, yeah, sister. Ya, yeah, khati. Please, please. So, yo, yo, take it easy. I know you're a Syrian. So, yo, yo, take it easy. Yeah. Yes, uh, Ernesto, go to hell with that pastor, your gay lover. Book your flight to hell. Go to hell. It's in the Valley of Hanam. Get Israeli Airlines and return to your vomit, you piece of garbage. So, shut your mouth. Okay, now. Now, I don't allow you to monetize me for two reasons. Number one, number one, because I don't want them to then censor my con content and delete my channel. Because when you monetize, that means they're going to put ads. And if those people who see your content, they may complain and I may get censored. God bless this channel for his glory and destroy opposition and close the door of censorship. That's number one. Number two, I don't take super chats because they take 30% of your money. Did you guys know that? Super chats, they take 30% of your money. Okay? You want me there? I don't know if you know that. They take 30% of what you give. Some people are okay with that. I'm not okay with that, right? If you guys feel led by the Spirit to contribute, PayPal, make sure you put it's a gift. Patreon, if you want to do it regularly, because that's where I get my income from, primarily PayPal and Patreon. And thank the Lord for putting in your hearts, because I hear people, are you 510C? No, I'm not. So if that bothers you, go to Mike Winger. He's 510C. Okay. But thank the Lord for PayPal, Patreon, and people who don't care about tax receipts, because the Lord's stirring your hearts. You have enabled me to stay in ministry. But here's where I may have to leave again. Pray God will show me. A distant relative of my family, a childhood friend I hadn't seen in years. We were buddies when we were kids, but we lost contact, meaning I didn't see him, but I would see him on Facebook. Passed away yesterday. He was only 53 years old. He was very poor health. He was on dialysis. He leaves away a young, beautiful teenage daughter. And my heart is hurting for his daughter. So because he's family, I really want to go. But which means that I have to now try to get a rent a car because I don't think my car is going to make it. Thank the Lord, my car. We fixed the transmission, but still doesn't mean, you know, it's in the best condition. I'd have to drive 10 hours because that's, I don't want to fly and then rent a car. So I may have to rent a car here. Pray God will show me because I got to get it soon and I need to travel. So I need to leave. So I'll probably be heading out. Lord willing, Friday or Saturday. I'm just trying to wait for when the funeral services are so I can get there a day before and stay there for a few days. So for those of you in Modesto and Turlock, pray. Lord willing, I'm coming up again. And I'll be there for maybe another week, which means I have to get a hotel room. So pray. This is money that I don't need to be wasting, and I'm not trying to waste it. Pray the Lord will provide and the Lord will protect me with the taxes and all, because it's hard when you do life by yourself, right? When you, when I had my ex-wife, she would take care of the taxes and all, but now I have to do stuff and I have to learn. So pray for it. He was a good guy. He really was. And I lost contact in that. We didn't talk much. I didn't see him for years. Childhood buddy, families related to my family, but I'd see him on Facebook and he'd post stuff and he was on dialysis and he went to the hospital a few days ago, but then come out. He passed away yesterday. 
And he's got one young, beautiful teenage daughter. I know she's devastated, man. Pray for him. His name is Sydney. Sydney Tariakos. Pray for his daughter, his angel, and his family. His parents died. He was the only son. So glory to God. The Lord blessed him with a daughter. The only grandchild of his parents. Good family. His mother was a good woman. His father was a good man. And now he dies. He was the only child. But he's got a lot of aunts, uncles, and a lot of cousins. And now he has a daughter. So I'm really hurt for his daughter. My heart hurts for his daughter because I trust and I believe he's with the Lord. That's my belief, right? Death is not the end of us. God has given us too much proofs. God is real. Jesus is Lord. He's alive. And the death, death is not the end of us. But it's those he leaves behind because now his young daughter, man, that's what sucks. Well, I see him. God bless you, brother. So pray that I can get the rent a car soon. I need to head out. That means I'll be gone again. So those of you, Modesto Turlock, pray, Lord willing, I should be there by the weekend if the Lord confirms. I need to go pay respects. It's family. Pray the Lord give me discipline, supernatural, miraculous, strict discipline, spiritually and physically, to get healthier, stay tight in the way I eat, and to be holier unto the Lord. So pray for that. So I'm really sad for his daughter. It's really hard. In fact, here, I'm going to read a post that she shared. I'm not going to give her name, but I'm going to read her post. It's the children, man. It's the parents that we leave. It's the people you leave behind. Sidney Kariakos, pray for him, that the Lord has mercy on his family. So his daughter posted this 15 hours ago. Damn, it's hard to read. It's what she says. Look what she says here. Man, it's moving me, man. And seen this guy face to face in years. Now I'm going to only see him in heaven by the grace of the Lord. Friends and family. Wow. This young lady is going to break my heart. Thank you for all the prayers and heartfelt wishes. Lord comfort her. I'm so sad to share the news of my daddy. May the Lord let me see my daughters and I die in their arms. Sidney Kuriakos was a loving father, a brother. A best friend to many. Above all, my daddy. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know. <clears throat> my daddy was someone that he could turn for a helping hand. He cared for every single person he loved. He lived and fought harder than anyone I ever knew in my life because he was on dialysis. Most of all, he had the biggest heart. The love he felt and shared through the years will never fade. <clears throat> if you would like to share a story about Sydney, please send me send one below. I love you, Daddy. I miss you so much, my best friend. <clears throat> I look forward to having another lunch with you again. Goodbye, Daddy, my angel. Sorry, guys. I didn't think it was going to hit me this hard. Pray for her. I don't want to mention her name. I don't want, you know, but him, Sidney Kuriakos. Pray I get there to show respects, right? I, I need to. Yeah, I need to get there. Pray the Lord will make a way. So pray for the family. Also, pray for truth. Her mother has pneumonia. Pray God will heal her. And uh, we have a sister, Sonia Cruz. Her daughter is sick. She's asking for prayer. Sonia Cruz, she's a regular. I don't know if she's here. So she said, if you can please give a prayer for my daughter that she makes a speedy recovery. She's really sick. She has a bad cold. So just wanted to see if you could do that for us. Thank you so much. So pray for Sonia Cruz Rodriguez's daughter. God give her perfect health, recovery. Truth's mom who's got pneumonia. And also pray for Jennifer who's sick as well. Pray for the sick. Pray for me that I stay healthy. So uh, pray I get there. I need to get there, man. I don't know. I got to rent a car. So pray for that. I'm hurt for uh, his daughter. Oh, there she goes. There's our sister right there. Here you go, sister. 
If I make all of you guys mods, they're going to get upset. Pray for Sonia, her husband, children, her daughter was sick. There she goes. If I make all of you mods, who's left then? So pray. I'm, I'm hurting for the daughter. That's why I'm breaking down. Those who die in Christ, they're resting. I'm not crying for him. I'm crying for the daughter. Because I have two daughters, and my prayer is that I will be with them and die in their arms and not distant from them. So pray for Sydney's daughter. Alex, well, where's your mo mother, Alex? Isn't she a whore? Alex, your mother's a whore, and she's very hot because she's known in Iran. She's a very hot whore. They whore around because she's a whore. And you're proof of it because she gave birth to a bastard. So where's your whore mother? We want to make her a mod because the Shia want to molest her because she's a whore. Because you're a whore and your mother's a whore. Let me see you face to face, you filthy whore. If your mother wasn't a whore, you wouldn't talk like that. But his mother's a whore. That's why he's got no respect because he's seen his mother do 20 Shia in one night and one hour. So when he sees his mother being a whore, he thinks all women are like his mother, a whore. You filthy whore. Right? Hold on, this guy's calling me. Aziza, I'm on the live stream. What's up? You want me to call you afterwards? Okay, I'll see you at the gym too. All right. You ready now? That's all. Pray. This is another brother who wants to head out that direction. So you guys ready? That's why I'm politically incorrect. Good to see you, G26. You disrespect people and disrespect your mother. She's a whore. He saw his mother, you know, getting ganged up by 20 Shia. So he thinks, oh, well, my mother's a whore. Then I'm a whore and everyone's a whore. You know, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the corrupt, unbelieving, nothing is pure. See, the guys don't know what they're messing with. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the discussion yesterday, what I had with that free gracer. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You see, the fruit of Protestantism, everyone and his mother now comes up with their own novel interpretation of scripture. And the guy goes to seminary. Do you see that? And the guy goes to seminary. You saw that talk yesterday, Layman Seminary? From Someone told me he's been in seminary for six years. And this is what you get from seminary. He pays seminary for this heretical teaching where he couldn't even exegete scripture if his salvation depended on it. Right? Free grace means... That all you need to do, brain, is confess Jesus as Lord. And it doesn't matter after that moment what you do. You can live like Muhammad or this guy, Alex's mother. You can be a whore like Alex's mother. Be a whore like her, like Alex's filthy mother, that whore. And it doesn't matter because you said that prayer, you're going to heaven. It's easy believism on steroids. Hyper grace. Anyway, are you guys ready to begin now? A lot of controversial topics. I didn't want to address it. Ah, Zaya Sophia, hold on. Dakit Aziza, Zaya. I'm good, good. I'm on a live stream right now, but what's going on with you, Azizi? Is that it? All right. All right. If you, then as it madlitli, maybe I'll drive you. Bazik madlitli. Ana bersham baz na lakhori wa, so I want to ask them baz min arisha. All right, it's all right. No, I'm just waiting because I thought maybe I'd look at here. Zilu, let me know. I'll, I'll take you, my friend. Baruch. You let me know. I'm not busy on it anyway. Okay, Aziza. God bless you. Okay, Mubtel. It's all right. Mubtel. Yeah, we're talking. It's another one. Sorry. It's live stream. Okay, so we're ready? That was that, that was a guy speaking Jilu. I was speaking Jilu. Are we ready? The controversy? Can I ask you guys, why is it that I look so handsome? If I do say so myself and be humble. See, I'm starting to look lean again, my face. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> my face is looking lean again. <laughs> oh, my, my. <laughs> All right, let's pray. You ready? You ready? All right, let's pray. Now let's be serious. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, and to ages of ages. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. You are the teacher, Holy Spirit. Please teach. Use me as your mouthpiece. Strengthen my throat, my lungs, my chest, my heart, my arteries with the health that I need, for you are the breath of life. Grant me discipline to get healthier, not be vain about it. Break my bondage to food addiction, to lust, to never shame the Lord Jesus. And you take over, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher. We are your dis disciples. Destroy every form of blasphemy, idolatry from us completely. And I pray you purge my motives to glorify Christ with pure motives, not ulterior motives, not to do it for status or fame or for money. Please, Holy Spirit. I truly depend on you. We truly need you. We need you, Holy Spirit. And I know this, and I can't do it without you. I will fail. Fail miserably. Better men of God than me have fallen. Please, Holy Spirit, do not give me what I deserve. Save us. Save our loved ones. Save my daughters, even their mother. And convict us to repent and to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And help us. Help me to be a doer of your word to practice what we preach. Destroy the beams from our eyes. Every form of blasphemy and idolatry remove and make us true holy servants of Jesus, loving him by obedience. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you make my voice pleasing to the ears of your servants and beatify us with the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. You take over. Own this channel. You are the teacher. Guide me to recall every jot to the poor scripture perfectly and exegete them perfectly and then live them out. Obey your word that I'm a doer of your word. And I pray that you bless everyone to know the word, to be in awe of your word, that my goal is to be used by you to point people to Jesus, that they fall more in love with Jesus and they forget me. May they forget me. And I don't bring attention to myself. And may I be transparent and honest with the Holy Spirit as much as possible so they don't make me more than I am. Save us from idolatry. Save me from my idolatry. May Jesus be glorified because we do not love him enough. We need to love him more. And I ask for that power that we love Jesus more Obey him more and make him more famous. Though he doesn't need us, he's pleased to work in and through us. Bless the inner connection, the audiovisual qualities. Bless my neighbors that I'm not a nuisance to them, but they see Jesus in us. Have your way, Holy Spirit, and save me from slander and envy and jealousy. All of us, gossip, maliciousness. Save us from lying and deceit and trickery, from lust and weakness. And I ask, Holy Spirit, protect us men from Jezebels and protect my sisters from wolves. Please do not allow us to defile ourselves, to keep pure until we die until marriage. Your will be done. We need you, Holy Spirit. Please do not let us go. We love you, and we ask you to give us power to perfectly love you. As sad as it is, we don't love you enough, not because we don't want to. You know our hearts. Our desire is to love you perfectly. Because to love you is to love the Father and the Son because you're one with them. But because of our flesh and our weaknesses and because we so easily succumb to our desires and so used to walking in the flesh and it's so unnatural to walk in union with you. Make that which is unnatural natural and what is natural unnatural to die to our flesh and to be perfectly submitted to you. We need you, Holy Spirit. We love you. This is your channel. We give you our lives, our possessions. Own us. Own my daughters, our loved ones. Own their mother. Bring her to full re repentance. Remove Martin. And help us to finish the race. That my life will glorify Christ and my death will glorify Christ. And never think I'm better than anyone. Remove the beams from our eyes. We love you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, glory to the Father, Holy Spirit. So I have to talk about another controversial subject that's now blowing up on social media. And it was brought to my attention by a very sincere brother. I didn't ask him if I can mention his name. I saw it on Facebook and I was taken aback. I didn't know what was going on, but then he brought it to my attention. And it turns out, sadly, this is why I need you to pray for me. And may the Holy Spirit guard my tongue and mouth and destroy the beams of my eyes. If you go back when I criticize Michael Lofton, Go back. It's on record. What did I say? I said, if Michael Lofton doesn't rein himself in and he keeps headed this path, he will end up destroying himself, shipwrecking his faith. You remember that? It's on record. Go back and watch. But before I mention him, do you see why I keep praying 
and asking you to pray. If you don't hate me and you love me, guard your hearts. Don't make me more than I am. Do not idolize me. The Lord destroy that. But if you love me, then you need to pray for me. The Spirit will fill me to overflowing. Save me from my flesh. Protect me from wolves and Jezebels. So I don't fall because when I tell you I'm not better than these men, I'm not. I know myself. That's my fear that if the Lord is angry with me, he hands me over. May he not be angry with me. May I not become the thing I hate and removes the beams from my eyes. So I don't say this in maliciousness. God, purify my heart. But when I see people like this, I fear for myself. Because it can happen to me. Cry out to the Lord, Lord, in your love for me. Me, Sam, Shimon, love you love all of us equally, but in your love for me, do not let me fall. Do not give me what I deserve and do not let me get puffed up. But to love you and fear you unto death. Please pray. Because if you go back, go watch. Go watch. I said it. I said if Michael Lofton continues his path, doesn't rein himself in, he's going to shipwreck his faith. And it's happening. Much like what happened with James White, Anthony Rogers. People I respected, but turn out to be wolves. And the Lord saved me from them. And I pray I don't end up like that. My God, we love you. Do not let me succumb. And if you see that I'm close to succumbing, save me, Lord. Save women from wolves. Save us. Save me from Jezebels. Please, my God. Glory to the Father and the Spirit. Well, guess what? He just did a session defending the Talmud by denying that the Talmud has negative, critical things to say about Jesus. He just did a session. I didn't watch it. I don't know if I want to watch it, but this precious brother who's reliable did watch it, and he sent me a clip. And the comment section, the comment section has gone wild. And I praise the Lord Jesus for the people in the comment section. Why? You'll find... Diehard Catholics who love the Lord, love the church, calling him out, rebuking him. So I praise God for them that they love the Lord more than they love celebrity figures. And I'll read some of their comments. He just did a session, Jesus in the Talmud, where he claims that the Jesus of Nazareth mentioned in the Talmud is not the Jesus of Christianity, the Jesus of New Testament history. It's some other Jesus. He's now seeking try to defend Against the assertion that the Talmud says blasphemous things about the Lord and his blessed mother, even though he'll admit that in the Catholic Church, you'll even have authorities, popes who admit that these statements in the Talmud are about Jesus, which led to the ire of the Catholic Church. He just, I'll give you the link. I'm going to read some of the comments. Here it is. I don't know what's happening to this guy. Two days ago, wasn't yesterday, my fault, Jesus and the Talmud. And go read the comment sections. The, the Catholics are in an uproar. And I'm going to show you this man is biting more, right, than he can chew. He's getting himself in deep waters and he's going to drown because I'm going to show you this man, Peter Schaefer, right, who wrote Two Gods in Heaven and Jesus and the Talmud. We're going to talk about that briefly. And I'm going to play a clip sent to me by a brother. And I didn't ask him if I could mention his name. He's a reliable brother, top-notch apologist. He's disgusted as well. Why in the world would you do a session trying to deny that the Jesus in the Talmud is Jesus Christ, trying to excuse the Talmud's slander and blasphemy of our Lord and his blessed mother, when even bona fide, reputable scholars admit, Peter Schaefer, I'm going to give you his credentials, that yes, that is supposed to be Jesus of the Christian faith, whom the Talmud mocks and ridicules and slanders, as well as his blessed mother. Okay? It's right there. See? Here you go. Yeah, I know that, Hebrew Catholic. We know that, see? Here you have a former rabbi who's now a devout Catholic who loves the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know who's texting me now. It's a bad time to text me. I don't know who this is. Anyway, you with me there? So I'm going to play a clip that was sent to me. He is going to shipwreck his faith 
He's not going to last. But brethren, I pray God will rein him in. But can you pray for me before I, before I play the clip? If you love me for the sake of the Lord and you don't hate me and want to see me destroyed, would you cry out to the Lord to save me from my own flesh? Not become puffed up, not succumb to lust, because I know how Satan wants to attack me. Either become puffed up or succumb to May the Lord save me from that. I don't succumb. My strength is in the Lord, and I finished the race and love Jesus. Because I've seen men fall like Ravi Zacharias or James White. May the Lord save me. So please, yeah, someone even, yeah, someone commented it. I'm going to read some of the comments. Someone commented it saying, he got us 30 pieces of silver. The Catholics are irate because they're offended that he would try to deny what even the Catholic Church has recognized are statements about Jesus in the Talmud. So, guys, are you ready for me to play the clip? And I'm going to show you what a recognized, bona fide scholar of Judaism. And I'm going to read these credentials. This is actually considered the standard work. This is now the reference work on what the Talmud says about Jesus. I'm not lying. Peter Schaefer, I'm not lying. I'm going to read in a minute. But let me play the clip that was sent to me and read some of the comments. Look what he says. I gave you the link. Here it is again. I don't know what's happening to this guy. Louis Dizon, you need to repent and stop associating with this guy. Because I was also told, I was also told by this reputable brother, reputable brother, that Louis Dizon is not allowed to go on other channels if he wants to frequent Michael Lofton's channel. In fact, you know what he calls his channel now? Have you seen it? If you start playing it, it's the John Michael Lofton show. Here, let me play it. I was playing at the beginning of it, and it begins with Michael Lofton show. Here, so you don't think I'm lying. I gave you the link. Start at the beginning because that gives you a link to the comment that I want to read. The Michael Lofton show. Here, right here. Let me even take a picture of it. It's now the Michael Lofton show. Here. What happened? Michael Lofton show, huh? Here, here you go. See it? See that? The Lord saved me from my pride and arrogance and from being fake. The Lord saved me from my pride and arrogance from being fake. The Lord destroyed the beams and please, Lord Jesus, in your love for me, do not let me fall into shame and to sin and lust. Lord, save me, please. I love you, Lord. I need you. See that? See? He's become a one-man show. He's become his own pope. Love you too, brother. I'm live right now. I know you're listening. God bless you. Right? Yeah, he is. He he does that. He blacklists people. He's dirty. He is. And I'm getting it from reliable sources. Sadly, these sources don't call him out publicly. See, this is what I don't like. Why are you guys afraid? What are you afraid of, man? Come out and call him out. Hold him accountable. If his sin is public, he needs to rebu rebu rebuke publicly. Don't believe the lies when people tell you, no, you should contact Brian. No, 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 that's garbage. A public sin is to rebuke publicly. Publicly. Go read Galatians 2, 11, 16. Paul says when Peter sinned publicly in full view of Christians by pulling away from Gentiles to appease the Judaizers, Paul publicly condemned him and rebuked him. A public sin affects others who look up to you, so you need to publicly condemn the person. Galatians 2, 11 to 16. You with me there? Everyone got it, right? The Michael Lofton Show. And I'm going to show you what a bona fide scholar of Judaism says. But let me play the clip. Wow, okay, well, God bless you. I'll contact you, uh, William, in a minute. Azizi. Thank you, brother. I was about to... William, I actually, I do call Jesse. He's the guy who does the insurance for me. Aziza, God bless you. Hold on. Let me uh, let me play the clip. I'll call you after this, William Aziza. Here's the clip, all right? I don't want to show you send it to me. Listen, Ken, listen to what he says in the clip. Man, where's the clip? Where do you send it to me? I think you sent it to me here. Hold on. Give me a second, guys, and we're going to get out of this. I think my cat wants to come in. One second. Where is the clip, dude? Hmm. 
Brother, you sent me a clip. I can't find it, huh? Hmm, let me see. Oh, here it is. You ready? Listen. Listen. This is from it. I don't want to show you who sent it to me. I didn't ask him if I could mention his name. You guys ready? Listen. You guys ready? You ready now? Let me know. I know there's a 16-second delay. From what I say, some appears on. Look what he says. Look what he says. I assume is boiling in semen. Well, okay, so you can see why see why some people would be concerned by the way this is described here it speaks of a jesus the nazarene you know boiling in excrement that sounds like this is a reference to um jesus of christianity right and so uh some people have been very concerned about this and you even find in church history in in church history he's admitting catholic church it would include cardinals bishops and popes have recognized these are statements about Jesus boiling in semen. And Peter Schaefer says, yes, it is about Jesus. It is about Jesus. Look what he's going to say. He's now become an apologist for Jews for Judaism. This is where uh, Talmuds were burned in part because of these kinds of concerns. But we have to ask the question, is this actually the Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene <laughs> that we Arrogant um, laugh. hold to in Christianity? Or is this a different Jesus, the Nazarene? Can it really this guy? Okay, now listen to what he said again. I'm going to play it again. I'm still as boiling in semen. Well... Okay, so you can see why some people would be concerned by the way this is described here. It speaks of a Jesus the Nazarene, you know, boiling in excrement. That sounds like this is a reference to um, no, that's not his Jesus point. Isaac. of Christianity. Nice right? try. And so uh, some people have been very concerned about this, and you even find in church history instances where uh, Talmuds were burned in part because of these kinds of concerns. But we have to ask the question, is this actually the Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene that we um, hold to in Christianity, or is this a different Jesus, the Nazarene? So it says Jesus the Nazarene, but that's not the Jesus that we hold to. Like this guy with a stupid comment. Does he mean that, well, like the Muslims think that Isa's Jesus? No, that's not what he meant. He's saying it's not Jesus. Now, I know that the Jesus of the Quran is not the real Jesus. The Jesus of history is the Jesus of the Gospels. But the Muslims think they're referring to the same Jesus. Likewise, the Jews think they're referring to our Jesus. Okay? Are you with me there? Now, let me tell you about this book. Get it. You serious students of the Bible? Get this. Jesus in the Talmud, Peter Schaefer. What is his credentials? He also wrote this book. I've written articles and I did sessions on this book. Peter Schaefer wrote Two Gods in Heaven. Put in Two Gods on my search engine on my blog or here on YouTube. Go watch the sessions and read the articles. He is considered a world-class, bona fide scholar on Judaism. Two gods in heaven. He shows that in Judaism, before, during, after time of Christ, they had a concept of two gods or two powers in heaven. He also wrote this standard work on Jesus and the Talmud. What are his credentials? Okay. What are his credentials? Okay. Here it is. Peter Schaefer. Peter Schaefer, is the R Ronald O. Perchman Professor of Jewish Studies and Professor of Religion Emeritus at Princeton University. Princeton University. His books include The Jewish Jesus, How Judaism and Christianity Shaped Each Other, and The Origins of Jewish Mysticism. Google his name, and you'll be told that he's considered the foremost scholar on Judaism. Okay? Peter Schaefer. 
Now watch here again. Who is he? Princeton. This is Prince. This is published by Princeton University Press. You think they're just going to let any Joe Schmo write? Now watch. You watch what it says. Okay. Let's see what it says about him. Right. Peter Schaefer is Ronald O. Perlman, professor of Judaic studies and director of the program in Judaic studies of Princeton University. His books include Mirror of His Beauty, Feminine Images of God, From the Bible to the Early Kabbalah, Princeton, Princeton and Judeophobia, Attitude Towards the Jews in the Ancient World, which has been translated into several languages. Google his name. He's considered the foremost scholar in Judaism. This is the standard work on Jesus. No, I'm not lying. And who published it? Princeton University Press. These guys are scholars. They don't just let any Joe Schmo publish. I'm going to quote to you what he says, because there are some scholars who say, well, no, that's not Jesus. That's some other figure. He addresses that in the book. But let me just see if my cat wants to come in. One second. I'm going to show you. And I'll read some of the comments and we begin. Chantel, are you the one that had questions? I'll bring you up. Let me see if the cat wants to come in. Yeah, that's what I thought I could get yeah, I don't know what these are, but hey, they're something. All right, now hold on. My cat had to come in. Can't get open the door. All right, now watch. Let's see what he says. This is a scholarly work on what the Talmud says about Jesus. And he says it is Jesus. Here. And I'm going to read some of the comments and we begin. It's not going to take me long. So let's go here. Let's see what he says. All right. All right. Here you go. Right here. Right here. Okay. Page seven, introduction. All right. I'm going to read this. Unlike Meyer, page seven, you see it? You guys listening, right? I hope you're not bored. We're going to get into the meat of the matter. Sola Fide and the Apostolic Fathers. Unlike Meyer and many of his predecessors, I start with the deliberately naive assumption that the relevant sources do refer to the figure of Jesus unless proven otherwise. The burden's on you to disprove this. Hence, I put the heavier burden of proof on those who want to decline the validity of the Jesus passages. See? More precisely, I do not see any reason why the Tanaitic Tenaid, Teneitic, ah, these words. Jesus ben Patera, Pandera, Jesus son of Pantera, Pandera, and ben Stada, son of Stada, passages, should not refer to Jesus. And I will justify this claim in the book. I'm going to prove it is about Jesus. Because Pandera is a play on the word Parthenos. So they would make fun of Jesus. Instead of saying he's the son of the virgin, Parthenos, he's the son of a Roman soldier named Pandera. Ironically, Origen, in his refutation of Celsus, the Greek pagan who wrote a book attacking Christianity, he said the rumor was that Mary sired Jesus by getting pregnant by a Roman soldier named Pandera. Right? Origen mentions that rumor already circulating in his time, late 2nd century, early 3rd century. And in the Talmud, Jesus is called the son of Pandera, mocking the fact that he's the son of the virgin Parthenos, and insinuating that a Roman soldier sired him. All right? So he will justify that it's Jesus. All right. Now look what he says here, page nine. Page nine. Okay. Look what it says. He's giving a summation of what the Talmud says about Jesus. They ridicule Jesus' birth from a virgin, as maintained by the Gospels, Matthew and Luke, and they contest fervently the claim that Jesus Messiah and the Son of God, but most remarkably, they counter the New Testament passion story with its message of the Jews' guilt and shame as Christ killers. Instead, they reverse it completely. Yes, they maintain, we accept responsibility. The Talmud says, yeah, we killed Jesus. They admit, we killed Jesus. We accept responsibility for it, but there is no reason to feel ashamed. The Talmud says, we're not ashamed of it. Why? 
because we rightfully executed a blasphemer and idolater. Jesus deserved death and he got what he deserved. So you can see it right there. Page nine, right? Let it stay there for a minute and read it. But Michael often, who thinks he's a scholar, who's shipwrecking his faith, thinks he knows better. Guy's a joke, folks. Stay away from him. Catholics pray he repents and warn. This guy is dangerous. He's become too big for his britches, and he thinks he's God's gift to the church. Now, let me read the comments, and I want to praise the Catholics who called him out and rebuked him and condemned him because their allegiance is to the Lord Jesus and his church, not to Michael Lofton. Here, let me read the comments. Here it is. Comment number one. I gave you the link. Veritas Unleashed. Michael Lofton's shilling goes against the understanding and teachings of the church for thousands of years and contradicts the rabbinical position as well. Is he a heretical Christian Zionist or just a useful dupe who wants to maintain a ready, steady shekel flow? Either way, he's exposed himself as untrustworthy. Wow. Harsh words indeed, but truth. Thank the Lord for pol political incorrectness. See? All right? That's what he posted. I'm going to read a few comments, and then we're going to begin. Okay? See that? Now watch some other comments. It's all there. Read it. I clear you link. Here's what Sailor Sabul says. The fact that they describe Jesus incorrectly to downplay his importance doesn't mean that isn't our Jesus. Exactly. They could just be misrepresenting Jesus. Okay, now look what this man says. Nick Simmons, 1305. Well, I actually heard from Jews that worship of Jesus consider idolatry to them. So yes, in their view... Jesus may very well have been an idolater. It wouldn't surprise me if some details were smudged on purpose to conceal what they mean. I would prefer to trust Pope Gregory IX on the subject. I'd rather go with the Pope Gregory what he said instead of you. Now, this one was really in the heart. Look what this guy said. Okay. Yeah, get rid of the dogs. Watch here. Don't engage them. Catholic Bible says, get rid of the dogs. Dude, God is 30 pieces of silver. <whistles> Edward Zachary one day ago. Dude, God is 30 pieces of silver. Okay. Okay, now watch here. Now look at this brilliant comment. Brilliant. And then we'll a few more. We're going to begin. Look at this. Circus, 19 hours ago. The Quran has conflicting details about Jesus, but no one assumes it's talking about a different Jesus. You see how he buried him? Brilliant observation. So, Michael, are you not going to say that Muslims are not talking about the Jesus you believe in because the details about that Jesus differ? Brother, I have that on my wall. I have it right on my wall. I'll show it to you later. You see it? All right. One more comment. A couple more, and then we're going to begin. So I just want to bring it to your attention. I said this man's going to hijack and shipwreck his faith and the faith. Now look what this person says. Sparkle Knits. I used to listen to this channel regularly, but the tone has changed in recent years. Reading through the comments makes me sad since Michael's response to people disagree with him, even respectfully, seems so disdainful and petty. He doesn't engage with the arguments people are making, just tells them they're mad because they don't like his facts. Very dismissive. Now watch this, and then that's it. I, you can read it. The backlash is praiseworthy. Lord bless you. You, men and women of faith, glory to God, you went after him. So much negativity against what he did. May he be ashamed of himself. Here. Caleb Starcher, 49342 days ago. Two days ago. 4934. This whole video was cold. And I would expect this from Tovia Singer. Not you, nor a Christian for that matter. So there you go. There you go, guys. We're done with him. That's it. So I just wanted to bring your attention.
don't take what this guy says. He even tried to mock me for quoting him accurately, and I went after him. Go watch the two sessions I did on Michael Lofton, where I took the comments he made, embarrassed him. He then came with a response that further humiliated him because then I showed what he said, and I was accurately representing him, and he felt stupid and cannot stand me because of it. The arrogance of this fake, because he'll tell you, yes, you know, charitable dialogue. There's nothing charitable about him. He's masking his arrogance. He's disgusting. See through the facade. Don't let that smile, that smirk deceive you, right? Wolves come in sheep's clothing. I'm being honest with you, brethren. So now with that said, we're done with him. Don't forget, get this book. This is the book by a bona fide scholar. Okay, don't listen to him. He's compromised. And it'll be a matter of time before he just shipwrecks his faith and he won't be a Catholic. God forbid, I hope God rings him in and saves me from becoming like that. But there we go. Now, that said, we may have someone ask some questions for me. Let's see. But we're going to Sola Fide. All right. But you see, Rishi, the problem is people will take truth in order to disarm you to trust what they have to say in order then to feed you their lies and deception okay okay no uh, Chantel, i'm not going to bring you up this question is not for you to share here because uh, it's too private okay let's begin are we ready now let's segue into it uh, let's segue into the early church fathers are we ready if you go to the description box You'll see I published two articles. Oh, beautiful, Kenny. Kenny, I'm going to make you one of my mods. You know, I lost a lot of people. I have uh, debates about SSP. I don't know. But, Kennedy, I'm going to make you a mod, all right? So you can comment. There you go. Now, guys, please don't bash this dude. If you don't like SSPX, just don't bash him. Because I've heard some people say SSPX, yes, they are in community. I don't know. Just don't bash him, please. Just leave it as it is. Let me make you a mod so you can comment freely. So there you go. Yep, he is an enemy. He doesn't, he thinks he's helping the church. He's not. He's 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 actually condemning the church. He's indirectly helping to destroy the credibility of the church. Yet he's thinking he's doing God a favor. Okay, now are we ready? Are we ready? Are we now going to regroup and focus? If you go off topic. You start attacking other Christians, or you start getting in, in an intramural debate, or you start condemning other branch of Catholicism, you're blocked. Focus. We're regrouping now. Now we put Lofton aside. He's done. Thank the Lord for those men and women of integrity who don't bow to him and think he's God's gift to the Catholic Church, like James White thinks he's God's gift to the Protestant Church. May the Lord save us from that arrogance and keep us humble and teachable. I pray that, Lord, save me from my own flesh. Do not let Satan win. Lord, give us the power of love you. Now we're going to regroup, talk about something beneficial. In the description box, you'll see links to two articles that I posted, one yesterday, one today, on the apostolic fathers. This will be the death knell for Sola Fide. Honestly, Protestants, if you are going to be honest to Christ, honest to the Bible, you cannot believe sola fide anymore. So if you're scared about facts, leave. Go to Mike Winger. Because I'm going to now cite disciples of the apostles, eyewitnesses of the apostles, men who were taught by the apostles, who by the grace of God left us writings, who were martyred for the faith, who gladly died as martyrs in their love for Jesus. Men whom the Spirit appointed, to be the successor of the apostles, to be the bishop of the church. Specifically, Ignatius and Polycarp, and Clement, who was the bishop of Rome. When I read what they said about salvation, justification, it will be over for Protestantism and sola fide. Because now you're going to have to do a lot of explaining. What do I mean? Focus, guys. Do not change the subject. These are men who heard directly from the apostles who were taught the faith from the apostles and appointed them by them to be the bishops of the church. Their view of justification is the Orthodox Catholic view. It's not sola fide. 
Now, this is going to put you in a position. Either this means the apostles poorly catechized them, or they butchered the teachings of the apostles and became apostate, or Martin Luther was not of God. He was a tool of the devil because he introduced a novel teaching unheard of by the successors of the apostles. Thank you, Jennifer. Are you with me there? It's the only options you have. Obviously, the first two options are not tenable because that would be blasphemy against the goodness and faithfulness of our Lord. So let me show you the articles. Let me get you the links. You ready? So I may have to do two parts. Lapanta, I know you're here. I hope you bless, brother. These are the facts that the Spirit has used to bring many, including myself, out of Protestantism. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Guys, if you love me for the Lord, pray, God preserve me. I stay pure until I get married or if the Lord doesn't want me to get married until I die. I need the Lord. I don't trust myself. And I'm being honest. Don't think I'm putting on a show when I tell you this. I fear. Because Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2.12. Right? We already have a dog manifesting in the comment section of my blog that I'm reinterpreting Ignatius and Polycarp. A filthy, satanic dog, a spiritual whore of the devil. The Lord crush your mouth, you filthy coward. Come on my live stream and show I'm misinterpreting them. You filthy son of the devil. See, that's what it is. They can't deal with the facts. So they're going to say, you're misinterpreting them. I pray. This is Jennifer. I said, pray for her help. All right, here's article number one. And I'll show it to you on the screen. Ignatius Polycarp, Solifiede, they're already manifesting like dogs. So I'm misinterpreting them, which means that they want me to go with their interpretation. Sons of the devil, may the Lord crush your mouths and protect people from you and use me to silence you until you repent. That's article number one. Second article, sola fide in clement, sola fide in clement, and you're going to be shocked. Sola fide in clement, you're going to be shocked. You know why? You know how you're going to be shocked? You'll be shocked how Clement interprets Romans 4, 78, and how Polycarp interprets Ephesians 8 to 9. You'll be blown away how they interpret these texts, which are common proof texts of Protestant heretics like Jamila Muhammad White and Antonia Fat Cow Dodgers to T. Sola Fide, and they interpret them exactly the way the Orthodox and Catholic traditions interpret them. Are you with me there? Let me repeat, brethren. I'm going to go slow. I'm going to show you the articles, and we're going to go slow. They interpret Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 and Romans 4, 7, 8. The proof text that Jamila Muhammad White and Antonia Cow Dodgers used to teach Sola Fide. And these eyewitnesses of the apostles interpret them to mean what Orthodox and Catholics have always understood justification to be. Nope. No, you are a coward. You're a filthy scum lowlife. Nope, thanks, channel. You're a son of the devil. Just because he did some good things doesn't mean we ignore the bad things. You son of the devil. Your allegiance is to Lofton, not to the church. You're Loftonian. You're more wicked than the Solowitians. You son of the devil. Just because he did some good doesn't mean when he does bad, we ignore it. Because Paul even rebuked Peter, because your allegiance is to Christ, you son of the devil. You filthy, wicked tool of the devil. Shame on you. The Lord chasing you. Now let's focus. You low life. All right, everyone ready? So we can focus now? Oh, I'm sorry. I, that was the wrong Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer, my apologies. I confuse you with another Jennifer. Jennifer, That Jennifer is not sick. God bless you. Jennifer, I thought you were this other Jennifer. Then why did I make you a mod? Jennifer, I told you to come. I was going to make you a mod. So I thought I was you. Now I got on mod her. Now she's going to be upset. See what you did? Oh, boy. Sorry. God bless you too, Jennifer. But I thought you are that Jennifer that was sick. All right, we ready now to get into it? Too many Jennifers because there's a Jennifer. I said, I'll make you a mod. This other Jennifer showed up. I thought it's her, and I made her a mod. Now I can't unmod her. Now she's not the one sick. The other Jennifer is sick. Pray the Lord to have mercy on her. 
Too many Jennifers on the block. There's only one original Jennifer. It's Jennifer Lopez. Stop imitating her. I don't know what this cat wants. Does this cat want food? Okay, let's begin. Here's the second argument I'm going to show it to you. Does this cat want food? What the heck does this cat want? What is it? You got food. You got your drink. Can I focus, kitty? Lord, give me control over my appetites. Yeah, I'll let you know. All right, here you go. Ernesto, are you the one that was manifesting, barking? I'm going to get you out of here. Okay. All right, now here, let me show you the articles. Come on, kitty, get out of here. Get out of here. May the Lord give me patience. All right, here we go. You ready? All right. Here's the article. Let me show it to you. And then we're going to begin. All right. Sola fide in Clement, because Jamila Muhammad White and his parrots, like Jeff Durbin, will misquote a passage from Clement to teach that Clement taught sola fide. And they'll admit this is the Clement who is a disciple of Paul. Okay? That's article number one. Okay, now ready for art of the second article. Take my materials, upload them, translate them, clip them, study them, and share them. Yours. But you owe it to the Lord to learn and present the facts accurately. And you owe it to the Lord to then catechize. Brethren, if you do your part, you have more Christians catechize, strengthen in their love for Christ and the scriptures. And they won't fall away if you do your part. Do your part. Here's the other article. Articles and scripture, exactly. Ignatius, Polycarp, and Sola Fide. We ready now? Are we ready? Begin. Let me start with Polycarp. Okay, let me start. Amen, Kennedy Report. Love you, brother. Now, help me to help you, brother. Let's stay focused. And one day I'll come on your channel and destroy your channel and its credibility. Now, guys, please do not go off tangents. Stay focused. Engage me. Do not go off tangents because I may have ADD. I may get discombobulated. Let's begin with Polycarp. Again, if you guys don't know who Polycarp is, if you don't know who he is, Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. At the age of 86, he was burned, but they say the fire could not consume, so then he was killed by the sword. He willfully died as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of 86. Polycarp was a disciple of the apostles, and I witnessed to the apostle John. Polycarp has left us a letter, and there is a detailed description of his martyrdom, which you can read online, martyrdom of Polycarp, which I read a while back. One of his disciples was Irenaeus. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. And I have articles on Irenaeus mentioning that Polycarp would share with them what he heard from John orally. Things that John taught him orally, not written down. Irenaeus was also a martyr who loved the Lord. Now, if you're going to tell me this man did not know how to be saved, then you're a joke. Find you another religion. And I witness of the apostles. If I tell you how he explained Ephesians 8 to tonight and what he thought about salvation, and you still insist on sola fide, find you another religion. Because there's no way this man got it wrong when he met the eyewitnesses, heard from them directly, the apostles of our Lord, died as a martyr for the truth, and you're going to tell me he got salvation wrong? Lord have mercy. Okay, so let's go here. I'll be quoting from Epistle to the Philippians, which is online for free. Here it is. You're going to be hurting, Protestants. I'm not, I'm not telling, I'm not lying. If you're not ready to hear what I'm about to share, Brother Elijah, I may be there at the end of the month. So pray for me, Elijah, Lord, because I want to come to Seattle for about a week or two. You're going to be hurting, Protestants. If you're not ready to hear this, leave. I'm telling you, if you love your tradition more than Scripture and the promises of our Lord in Scripture, leave. Here's where you can read the article for free. It's not going to bode well. Watch here. But thank the Lord, he opened my heart, set me free. I rejoice. Had it been 20 years ago, it would have rocked me. Had it been years ago, it would have rocked me. Here it is. There it is online. You can read it. So you don't think I'm lying. Okay, now let's read. You ready? Yep, bring the Bobgorn and Bibsy. Bibsy and Bobgorn. All right. Epistle to Philippians. Now, notice who Polycarp is writing to. 
the Philippians. Do you know why that's important? The Philippians. Because that's a church that Paul wrote an inspired epistle, the letter to Philippians. So Polycarp is writing to the Christians that the Apostle Paul wrote to, the letter to the Philippians, which contains a poem or a hymn glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ as the divine son who in his pre-human existence already was existing in the nature of God, who humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant. And he's writing to those Christians. Are you ready? Pay attention. Class has begun. Boy, is this going to hurt some folks. Watch how he's going to interpret Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. Oy vey. Chapter 1. I'm not going to quote all of it. So there you can read it. I'll only quote the relevant sections. Because they'll say, see, he taught sola fide. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. Boy, you're in a world of hurting. Chapter 1. Praise of the Philippians. I have greatly rejoiced with you in our Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, class has begun. Please don't distract each other. Because you have followed the example of true love as displayed by God and have accompanied as became you those who were bound in chains. You know, you, you serve those who are in, in prison. <clears throat> the fitting ornaments of saints, you see, it is befitting a saint to go to prison for the Lord because he's worthy. And which are indeed the diamonds of the true uh, God and our Lord. God crowns you who suffer for him. <clears throat> and because the strong root of your faith spoken of in the days long gone by, he's referring to the time where Paul praised them in his letter to the Philippians, endures even until now, now even long after the apostles, Paul, who passed away, you still endure and brings forth fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sins suffered even unto death. But whom God raised from the dead, having loosed the bands of the grave, in whom though now you see him not, you don't see him physically, you believe, and believing, rejoice, rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, into which joy many desire to enter. Now, watch how he's going to interpret Ephesians 2 tonight. See, they know Scripture. He's citing, alluding to Scripture, like Ephesians 2 tonight. Benny Blanco, I'm about to send you out here because you know that's a fake name. Knowing that by grace you are saved, not of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. Aha! He taught sola fide. Guys, he's alluding to Ephesians 2. You want to get shocked how he interprets Ephesians 2, 8 to 9? I did a session where I mentioned Ephesians 2, and by my reading of the text through the grace of the Lord, I came to the same conclusion that this holy martyr came to long before I even existed. See, when you are seeking the Spirit, yielding the Spirit, He'll bring you to the same truth that he brought those before you because we're drinking from the same spirit and the spirit will not lead you to confusion if you yield to him and not try to draw his voice. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now watch. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, right? Knowing that by grace you're saying, not of works. But now look how he explains it. Chapter 2, an exhortation. Aha, look at this here. Wherefore, girding up your loins. Now he's explaining. God has chosen to save you by his unmerited favor, not on the basis of your works. But it doesn't mean what the Protestants tell you what it means. I'm going to explain it when I read it. Wherefore, girding up your loins, serve the Lord in fear and truth. Serve. These are deeds you do. These are deeds you do. Because watch, I was going to explain how that salvation is obtained. How do you obtain that salvation? Pay attention. Watch, I'm going to post it here entirely. Wherefore, girding up your loins, serve the Lord in fear and truth, as those who have forsaken the vain, empty talk, and error of the multitude, and believed in him who raised up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, and gave him glory, and a throne at his right hand. To him, all things in heaven and on earth are subject. Him, Every spirit, see, notice high Christology, Trinity, him, Jesus, Jesus sits in throne at the right hand of God, the father. Jesus died physically, been raised physically, and Jesus will be served, latruo in the Greek, will be given the worship due to God by every spirit, every spirit, human or otherwise, 
must worship Jesus because he will come to judge the living and the dead. Trinity right there because Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is the Father's Son. He became man, died for our sins, was raised. He's now glorified. Has a throne at the right hand of the Father. Notice they're not the same person. And Jesus is more than a man because every breathing spirit, whether angels or human, every spirit creature will give him latruo. That's the Greek word. Latru, I believe it's latriusi. Anyway, latruo in the Greek. What Jesus says is the worship given to God alone. And Polycarp says Jesus will receive the worship due to God alone by every spirit that has been created, whether angelic or human. And who's saying this? An eyewitness of the apostles, a disciple of John. Where did he get this from? He got it from them. You just destroyed Arianism and modalism. He's not a modalist. He's not an Arian. You got it? And I did sessions on what Polycarp said about worshiping Jesus as God. And yet he's not the father. But here's where it gets good. It's going to get good. You ready? Polycarp, how do we obtain this salvation that God gave out of his mercy? How do we obtain it? You ready? You ready, Protestants? Uh-oh, Protestants. I may not have to do a part two. You ready, Protestants? Oh, ouch. His blood will God require of those who do not believe in him. If you don't believe in Jesus and his shed blood, God will punish you. Now watch here. How are we saved? Damn. Here's the Orthodox Catholic doctrine of justification. But he who raised him up from the dead will raise us up also. Now why? Notice, Kiri Leisun. The one who raised Jesus from the dead will raise us if we do his will and walk in his commandments. If we do his will, you just buried sola fide and you buried it in the pit of hell. If we do his will and walk in his commandments and love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness, covetousness, love of money, evil speaking, false. I mean, these are all deeds. That's how God will raise us? Yeah, by your deeds. Faith and works, Polycarp. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing or blow for blow. Don't know how many scriptural allusions there are or cursing for cursing, but being mindful of what the Lord said in his teaching. Oh, well, we're not done. Bye-bye, Protestantism. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, bye, 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 bye. That was chapter two, right? But watch what happens in chapter 10. Oh, vey. Chapter 10. Guys, you're going to get shocked if you don't know this already. Judge not that you be not judged. See, you better do these things. That's how God will raise you immortal. Forgive and it shall be forgiven to you. Be merciful that you may obtain mercy. With what measure you measure, it shall be measured to you. That doesn't sound like sola fide. Once more, blessed are the poor and those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for there's the kingdom of God. In case you missed it, Protestants, an eyewitness of the apostles, an eyewitness taught by the apostles, catechized by the apostles like John, appointed by the apostles, a holy bishop who died as a martyr. You're a joke in comparison to him. I'm a joke in comparison to him. And he says, what? But he who raised them up from the dead will raise us up also if we do his will. That's Matthew 7, 21, 23. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, to me, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven and walk in his commandments. You're going to tell me he didn't know the gospel? You're going to tell me he didn't know justification? You're going to be that arrogant? But Martin Luther, who comes in the 16th century, knows more than him? Emilio, I just told you Polycarp is a disciple of the apostles. If you're not listening, get the hell out of here, man. He was a disciple of the apostles who met John. Now watch chapter 10. You guys want to get blown away? You want to get blown away? It's all in my article. Protestants, say bye-bye to your canon. Why? Guys, this is going to shock you. You ready to get shocked? Chapter 10. 
Watch here. Chapter 10. It's all there. Bye-bye to the Protestant canon. Bye-bye to the Protestant canon. Get out of here, rail bags. Go to hell. Book your ticket. May Hamas find you. Bye-bye to the Protestant canon. Watch here. Exhortation to the practice of virtue. Stand fast, therefore, in these things. Now watch G26. You guys ready? Catholics, Orthodox, rejoice in your canon. And follow the example of the Lord, being firm and unchangeable in faith, loving the brotherhood, First Peter 2. Look how many allusions to Scripture. And being attached to one another, right? Joined together in the truth, exhibiting the meekness of the Lord in your intercourse with one another. Now watch here. Oh, Yve, when I found this, I'm like, you got to be kidding me, man. How the hell did I miss this? Because I didn't care about the early church. Now watch here, in your intercourse, in your conversation, in your lifestyle, with none other, and despising no one, when you can do good, defer it not. Don't delay it. Why? Because alms delivers from death. He just made an allusion to the book of Tobit. Say what? He's quoting Tobit where Raphael tells, <clears throat> says, Giving charity, giving alms makes atonement. Why is he alluding to the book of Tobit? Why is an eyewitness of the apostles, a disciple of John, quoting Tobit as scripture, as authoritative writing to determine faith and practice? I told you, you guys are going to be in a world of hurting. And I'm going to show you where he's quoting from. It's all in the article, by the way. I, it, all of this information I got in the article, so you don't need to worry about looking for it. It goes on to say, Be all of you subject to one another, having your conduct blameless among the Gentiles, that you may both receive praise for your good works, and the Lord may not be blasphemed through you, but woe to him by whom the name of the Lord is blasphemed. Teach, therefore, sobriety all, and manifest it also in your own conduct. But I thought if you add works to the blood of Christ, you're nullifying the blood of Christ. How can charity atone for sin? That means the blood of Jesus is insufficient. No, it means that your understanding of the work of Christ is wrong because you're blinded. Why is Polycarp alluding to Tobit? And here's what I write in my article. Watch here. Here's what I say. Watch here. Focus, brethren, please. I want to get you out of here. All right. Remarkably, this is what I say in my article. Polycarp interprets Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Not by works, lest any man should boast. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, and not by works, lest any man should boast. Polycarp interprets that passage in a consistent fashion with the Orthodox and Catholic views of salvation and justification. Now watch. He understands this passage to refer to God's graciously willing for all individuals to be saved through Christ, not that salvation comes by faith alone. I'm going to break that down in a minute. Okay? But now, what else he does? Oh, boy. It's all my article. I'm going to show you where he's quoting from. Okay. Polycarp is clear that this salvation that God has chosen to bestow, the salvation that God has chosen to grant because he's gracious and merciful, is given to those who do God's commandments. Those who do God's commandments. And even quotes from the Deuterocanonical book of Tobit to prove that charity makes atonement for sins. Here are the verses which this holy martyr references. Look what he quotes. I'm not going to quote all of it. It's Tobit, the book of Tobit, chapter 4, verses 5 to 11. But here, let me just quote the relevant part and watch here. Does this sound like Martin Luther? 
Jamila Muhammad, why? So here, Tobit, chapter 4, 5 to 11. Okay, what, read with me. Specifically, Tobit, chapter 4, verse 10. Read with me. So you will <clears throat> be laying up good treasure for yourself against the day of necessity. Now watch. For charity, being charitable, giving financially, helping those in need, delivers from death and keeps you from entering the darkness. And for all who practice it, practice charity, all right? Charity is an excellent offering in the present most high. When you give charity financially, you're giving a sacrifice to God. That's what Polycarp said. It says charity delivers from sin. And here's the other passage he's alluding to. Tobit chapter 12, verses 8 to 9. Then we're going to go into Ignatius. Tobit chapter 12, verses 8 to 9. Prayer is good when accompanied by fasting. Alms giving, that charity, and righteousness. A little with righteousness is better than much with wrongdoing. It is better to give alms, may the Lord give me the power to practice what I preach, than to treasure up gold, bank accounts. Lord, please help us to use it for your glory. For alms giving delivers from death, and it will purge away every sin. Those who perform deeds of charity and righteousness will have fullness of life. But wait, what did Polycarp say? What was Polycarp alluding to? And who was Polycarp? A disciple of John and the other apostles? Here you go. Here you go. This is from Polycarp, chapter 10. Look, what is he re referring to? What is he alluding to? When you can do good, defer it not. Because alms delivers from death. That's Tobit chapter 4, verse 10. You understand the Protestant view of the death of Christ, which rules out the good deeds that you do in union with Christ and his vicarious death that makes your deeds acceptable, thereby moving God to reward you with immortality. Their view that excludes that is not biblical and it's not ancient. Let me get my socks because it's getting cold on my feet. You got it now? Thank you. Lean. Praise the Lord, Mag. Stay leaner and healthier. Are you catching it? So this view that, hey, works, nullifies the blood of Christ. Where'd you get that from? You didn't get it from the Bible. You didn't get it from the disciples of the apostles. So the only option you have now, Protestants, Polycarp preached a false gospel. Polycarp was apostate so that the success of the apostles corrupted the faith so that Joe's witnesses, Adventists, Mormons are right. The church became corrupt, needed to be restored, and you'd be blaspheming. You're stuck, Protestants. You can't get out of this. Time to leave. Time to leave. Right? Time to say bye-bye. And what do you do with the fact that Polycarp used Tobit for doctrine, he alludes to Tobit, Tobit, to establish practice, doctrine. Why is he quoting Tobit? To bind Christians to orthopraxy, correct living, and using it to teach doctrine of how you're saved if it's not inspired scripture. Are you with me there? Yeah, Azra, go to your whore mother. She's waiting. So here's what I say. So watch what I say. And we're going to go to Ignatius, and then hopefully we won't have to do. All right. We won't have to do a part two. If you guys are okay with this, you go join it. Okay, watch here. Here's this all of my article. Hence, not only does Polycarp teach that believers are saved. Ben, can you get out of here, Ben Rahi? Go to Mike Winger's waiting for you. Polycarp that teach believers are saved by their obedience to God's commandments. Saved by their obedience to God's commandments. Crystals, you see that? He even accepted the canonicity of the book of Tobit, a writing which Protestants reject as inspired scripture. You're in hurting, man. 
Damn, you hurt. Damn, you be hurting, boy. Now, did you see how Polycarp interpreted Ephesians 8 tonight? Did you guys catch it? Can I break down how he explained it? Because when I show you how Clement explains Romans 4, 7, 8, you just buried Jamila Muhammad White. Okay. You with me there? Let me show you how he interpreted Ephesians 8 tonight. This is a passage that I was taught the incorrect interpretation of. Passage that's used by that slob, that false teacher, Anthony Rogers and Jamila Muhammad White. Okay? Ephesians 8 tonight. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. See? You're saved by grace alone. No works you do. Now, that that's not the meaning of the text, let me finish the thought. Listen. Paul then says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, let me repeat. Let me now read the context, explain what Paul is actually saying, and Polycarp confirms that interpretation. So I thank the Lord that he enabled me to see what the text actually meant. And now I have confirmation. Thank you, Lord, for showing me we're on the right path. Okay, one more time. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. For, now it explains what it means, right? To obtain that salvation through faith. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared that we should walk in them, right? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, what is he actually saying? Here's what he's saying, and Polycarp confirms. Are you listening? I need you to listen, please. Don't let the demons distract. What Paul is saying, as confirmed even by Polycarp, who heard from the eyewitnesses, is that salvation isn't something that you earned by the deeds you did, thereby moving God to grant you mortality. No. The reason why salvation is offered is because God is a gracious God, a merciful God, a loving God, who wants to save his creatures because he doesn't want to destroy them. So what Paul is saying is, it wasn't because of the deeds you did that you force God to act towards you by granting immortality. Because if God based salvation on your righteous deeds, then you'd wait forever because you could never move God, making God your debtor. So then God chose out of his own kindness, his love, his compassion to save. Now that he chose to save, how do you obtain it? You obtain it by faithfulness. That's why I keep telling you that Paul defines faith as being faithful to the Lord by obeying him. That's exactly what Polycarp just said. You with me there? You understand what it means? In other words, it's what the Catholics and Orthodox have taught. Sola gratia. You're saved by grace alone. Did you know that, Protestants? The official teaching of the Catholic Church is you're saved by grace alone. No one denies it. Meaning if God wasn't pleased out of his favor, mercy, and kindness to save, then no one could be righteous enough to make God a debtor to him or her where God is now obligated to grant you mortality. All of us would go to hell. But God, who is loving, compassionate, says, I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to live, and I want you to repent, and your debt will be paid. Now that God has chosen out of his love to grant you salvation, how do you obtain it? You obtain it by your faithfulness to Christ. That's what faith means. Union with Christ and walking in obedience with him. That's how Polycarp interpreted Ephesians 8 to 9. Exactly. See, even you see, you get my point? You got it now? 
He did not interpret it like Jamila Muhammad White. Exactly, Juj. They all understood that the faith that Paul had in mind is being faithful to the Lord. Faith that is being faithful to the Lord. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. That's why there's confession, repentance, restoration, all provided by the atoning death of our Lord. He earned those graces. We get it now? Now, this is Polycarp. What are you going to do? All you're going to do is claim I misinterpret him. Stick it where the sun shone, don't shine. It's plain as day. You Bible, you butcher the fathers like you do the Bible. Okay, now, let's go to Ignatius. Are we ready? Are we ready? Now, focus. Don't help me to help you. Just focus. Ignatius, who's also in that article. Here's the article again. Boy, these apostolic fathers are troublesome for the Protestants. And I'll explain why they're called apostolic fathers later. So here's the article. Okay, and then we'll wrap it up with Clement. And you're going to see how dishonest, dishonest, wicked Jamila Muhammad White, Antonia Dodgers, Jeff Durbin are, and how they handle the fathers. And yet, Jeff Durbin is a parrot of James White, and James White claims to teach church history. That means the man is accountable. He's deliberately deceiving people. The Lord remove him from ministry. Because if he claims to be a church historian, that he teaches church history, that means he knows he's lying. Inexcusable. I thank the Lord for opening my eyes to him, that he is not of the household of faith until he repents. Now let's go to Ignatius. Ignatius. Now let me explain who Ignatius is. It's all in my article. You ready to see who Ignatius is? Are you enjoying this discussion or no? Let's see who Ignatius is. Are you enjoying it? We ready? Okay. Hopefully I'll finish. Pray for the Lord to energize me and strengthen me. To get healthier and holier, more disciplined. I'm not young anymore. All right. Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, Syria. In Syria. He dies as a martyr. Between 107 and 112 AD. On his way to Rome, he writes seven letters that have been preserved. And there are different editions of his letters. There's the longer recension, the middle recension, and the shorter recension. Right? But no serious scholar denies that Ignatius left seven letters. They prefer to go with the shorter recension, but it doesn't mean that's the original form of his letters. Be that as it may, these letters have been preserved. He was a disciple of the apostles. He knew the apostles, Peter, Paul, John. He even mentions Peter and Paul, and he says, I don't write with, to you with the wisdom of Peter and Paul. He then writes a letter to the church at Rome begging them, do not intercede, intercept, and stop me from being killed. He's begging them that he wants to go to the Colosseum at Rome, and he wants to offer his flesh as bread to God by allowing the animals, the beasts, the lions, to eat him alive. And he did. He gladly died as a martyr for Jesus. The bishop of the church in Antioch, where they were first called Christians, an eyewitness of the apostles, Peter, Paul, and John. That's who Ignatius is. You know what I mean? So we're not dealing with any Joe Schmoes. Just to tell you the dishonesty of Jamila Muhammad White, he will quote Ignatius to prove the Trinity, that he had a high view of Christ, Christ is God in absolute sense, and that he was a Trinitarian, but he'll ignore what Ignatius says about the bishop being the head of the church, not a plurality of elders, the bishop, and the presbyter subject to the bishop and the deacon subject to them. He ignores that and ignores these other statements. You see how dishonest this man is? He's not worth your respect. You'll accept Ignatius when he agrees with your view of the Trinity. But then when Ignatius tells you, submit to the bishop because he's in the place of God and there's no salvation apart from the bishop, the bishop, one bishop ruling the church, elders subject to him, deacons subject to them, which James White rejects, he ignores him. 
He ignores that. He ignores that. As does Anthony, that cow Dodgers. They're not men of your respect. They're evil. Because they butcher the fathers like they do the scriptures. May they repent before it's too late. So now, let's see what he says. So, I in my, in my article, I say, Ignatius warns Christians against succumbing to the temptation Temptation of seeking to be justified by keeping the law of Moses. Oop, I got a typo. Guys, if you notice typos in my articles, please bring them to my attention. Please. Just send me a line. Say, hey, brother, you got an error here and there because I'm not perfect. I'm more perfect than most of you, but still not perfect. Okay. Temptation. See, I know it. Uh, let me correct it. Of seeking to be justified by keeping the law of Moses. Now, Talk about a blow, a black eye to Sabbatarian heretics, like Bible pervert in a box. Look what he's going to say to those Christians who insist that you keep the Sabbath. Ooh! Ah! Okay. He warns Christians of not being tempted to be justified by keeping on Moses such as Sabbath observance. He further exhorts them, commands them to remember that the deeds which believers perform can never be sufficient enough to earn the right to immortality, which is why salvation depends on the kindness and grace of God. Again, like Polycarp, he's reminding them, if you think by your deeds you'll be justified, then you will cease to exist because you can never be righteous enough to make God your debtor. It is out of his kindness that he saves you. That's why he goes on to say the same thing. Now watch. At the same time, however, Ignatius is clear that this grace, the favor that God has decided to bestow on us by wanting to save us, is received by faith and maintained by living in obedience to God's will. You catch it? What he does not believe? He does not believe it's sola fide. He's saying, if you think you can earn immortality by your deeds, you'll cease to exist because you'll never be that good. Thank the Lord that he was gracious enough to want to save you. Now that he wants to save you, that salvation is yours by faith, a faith that you maintain by living in obedience to him. In other words, the Catholic Orthodox teaching of salvation. Everyone got it? That's what he's going to say. But watch the blow to Sabbatarians. Watch the blow to Sabbatarians. Look what he's going to do. Hold on. You ready? And then we're going to end it with Clement. Clement is longer than them, but still. Chapter 9 of his epistle to the Magnesians. Here's the link. Look what he says. I hope you're enjoying this, brethren. May the Lord give me the health and holiness to bless you. I hope your faith is strengthened. You Orthodox, you Catholics... You've had the true, correct understanding of salvation all along. We were the ones who were misled by the Reformation. But better late than ever. So here it is. You can read online, translation. Look what he says. Okay. Chapter 9. Look at the warning. A blow to Sabbatarians. Remember who he is. An eyewitness of the apostles. Taught by the apostles. Peter, Paul, John. The bishop of... The church in Antioch, Syria, the place where they're first called Christians, a holy martyr of our Lord. Look what he says to the Christians at the time of his writing. Look. Watch here. Let us live with Christ, chapter 10. If, therefore, those who were brought up in the ancient order of things have come to the possession of new hope. Ancient order of things means the Old Testament. No longer observing the Sabbath. What? No longer doing what? You no longer do what? You don't observe the Sabbath anymore. But living in the observance of what? The Lord's Day. Say what? The churches of the apostles? Started by the apostles? Governed by their successors who replaced them? And they all have this in common? They don't observe Sabbath, but the Lord's Day, Sunday, on which also our life has sprung up. 
because he is our life. His resurrection is our life. Again, by him and by his death, whom some deny, by which mystery we have obtained faith, and therefore endure. So we got to endure. That we may be found the disciples of Jesus Christ. See, no endurance, you're not a disciple. You better endure. How shall we be able to live apart from him? Whose disciples, even the prophets, saying even the Old Testament prophets were disciples of Christ because they announced his coming. In the spirit, the spirit made known to them he's coming. Did wait for him as their teacher. And therefore, whom they rightly waited for, having come, raised them from the dead. He raised them from the dead. Total, why is your mother a whore, total Chad, and a Shia whore? And why are you a whore bastard, a son of a whore, thinking that your opinion matters? Let me see you face to face and see how brave you are. Okay, chapter 10. Watch here. Total whore. Not total Chad. Total whore like your mother. Anyway, here you go. You're not a total Chad. You're a total fag. Chapter 10, a total fag. Chapter 10. Here we go. Now, he goes on to say, he goes on to say, beware of Judaizing. Beware of the Judaizers. Beware of the Judaizers. Listen. Okay. Let us not, therefore, be insensible to his kindness. You see? Understand him. Don't be insensible, ignorant, and stupid of God's kindness. If God wasn't kind, none of us would live. For were he to reward us according to our works, we should cease to be. Did you catch it? If God chose to act in strict justice and strictly recompense you for what you earn, we would be wiped out. Don't underestimate, don't take advantage his kindness. Because if you want God to recompense you, recompense you due to strict merit, what you truly deserve, what you've truly earned, he'd wipe you out. So don't ever be that arrogant to think that you can be so righteous that God now has to grant you immortality. If he wasn't kind, we'd all be wiped out. For were he to reward us, according to our works, we should cease to be. Therefore, knowing this, that it's his kindness that has chosen to save us and his kindness that has chosen to reward us for these meager efforts that we do in our love for the Lord, but because of what the Lord did makes them acceptable to him, so he rewards us, having become his disciples. Let us learn to live according to the principles of Christianity. For whosoever is called by any other name besides this is not of God. Don't you dare be ashamed of be calling yourself Christian. Okay, now watch. Let's continue. We ready? Continue. Because you're going to see I'm not making it up. He doesn't teach sola fide. And watch what he says about the Holy Eucharist. And then we go to Clement. We're done. Amen, Jennifer. Okay, watch here. Lay aside, therefore, the evil, the old, the sour leaven, and be changed into the new leaven, which is Jesus Christ. Be salted in him, lest anyone among you should be corrupted. Lest you be corrupted, because if you're corrupted, what happens? Since by your Savior you shall be convicted. It is observed to profess Christ. It is foolish and stupid to profess Christ, Jesus, and to Judaize. You can't have both seven-day Adventists. You can't have Jesus and your Judaism. For Christianity did not embrace Judaism. But Judaism embraced Christianity. So that every tongue which believes might be gathered together to God. See it? Now watch. What does he say in another epistle? Watch here. Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 20. Tell me if this sounds like Jamila Muhammad's white theology. Tell me if this sounds like Jamila Muhammad's, Muhammad's white's theology. Now watch here. Chapter 20, promise of another letter. Look at here. If you're saved by faith alone, then explain this to me. 
So let me go here. Watch here. And we're almost done. Then we're going to go to Clement. We'll be done. Promise of the Lord, if Jesus Christ shall graciously permit me through your prayers, and if it be his will, I shall in a second little work, which I will write to you, make further manifest to you the nature of the dispensation of which I have begun to treat with respect to the new man, Jesus Christ, in his faith and in his love and his suffering and his resurrection. Now watch here. Watch. Tell me who has his view of the Eucharist. Who has this view of the Eucharist? The Eucharist. Watch here, Stacy. Who has this view of the Eucharist? Especially will I do this if the Lord make known to me that you come together man by man in common through grace, individually in one faith and in Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David according to the flesh. So physically, a descendant of David, being both the Son of Man and the Son of God. Watch here the importance of the bishop. Bishop, not bishops one bishop head of the presbyters and deacons and the church listen protestants this is an eyewitness to the apostles telling you how the apostles set up the structure of the church so that you may obey the bishop and the presbytery the bishop and the elders with an undivided mind breaking one and the same bread which is the medicine of immortality. Ooh, the bread that you celebrate every week is your medicine. Why do you think I keep calling the Eucharist medicine? It is your medicine that gives you more life. The antidote to prevent us from dying. You take that Eucharist, that bread, it will save you from dying spiritually and sustain you eternally. By which causes that we should live forever in Jesus Christ. Who has this view of the Eucharist? This is the epistle of Ephesians. Now notice who he's writing to. The Ephesians, struggling Protestant. Why is that important? Because Paul wrote a letter to the Ephesians. That means the churches of the apostles that the apostles appointed and wrote to Believe this about the Eucharist because Ignatius is writing to the Ephesians. That means that's what they believe about the Eucharist. Who has this view of the Eucharist? James White? Anthony Rogers? John MacArthur? Mike Winger? Who has this view? Matt Slick? Who? Love you too, Evangelia, Alexander. Who has this view? Time to leave Protestantism, brethren. Really it is. It's time to leave. Now, whether you become Orthodox and Catholic, I will praise God for you. Don't get me involved in that. That's you and the Lord. Who has this view? Now watch the final point. Then when we come to Clement, hey, hey, what's going to happen with Clement? Another passage that Protestants distort that Clement butchers them on. Watch here. Ignatius, his epistle to Polycarp. Now what's the significance of this letter? Polycarp and Ignatius knew each other. Polycarp and Ignatius were contemporaries. Polycarp and Ignatius loved each other and praised each other. And Ignatius writes a letter to Polycarp. So they both knew each other. They both praised each other. They're writing to each other. And they're disciples of the apostles. What? There it is. And what does he write? And he says to Polycarp. Chapter 6. He's writing to his churches. And who was the bishop at that time? Polycarp. And look what he says to the members of Polycarp's church. What does he write to the members of Polycarp's church? Two contemporaries who praise each other, love each other, discipled by the apostles, bishops who died as holy martyrs. I'm going to look to them. I'm not going to look to Jamila Muhammad White. Chapter 6. The duties of the Christian flock. Look what he says to, he's writing to the church. 
the Polycarp's the bishop. Look what he says to them. Give heap to the bishop. Listen to your bishop who's Polycarp. That God also may give heat to you. You want God to pay attention to you? Pay, pay attention to your bishop. My soul be for theirs that are submissive to the bishop. I'll give you my life if you submit to the bishop, Polycarp, and to the presidents, the elders, and to the deacons. And may my portion be along with them in God. Now watch. Labor together with one another. Strive in company together. See, we're a church. We have to gather as a church. Run together. Okay, watch here. It's going to get bad for you Protestants. He now says your eternal life is a reward. You get rewarded for your deeds. Here. Okay. Strive in company together. Run together. See, we got to do things as a body. Suffer together. Sleep together. See, we got to do life, church. We got to do life. We are one. We're inseparable. All of you do everything together. You're my family. I'm your family. And awake together as the stewards and associate servants of God. Now watch him. Watch what he says. Is eternal life by faith alone? Is eternal life by faith alone? Is eternal life by faith alone? Watch here. Watch here. Please him under whom you fight. You're his soldier. Look, you're a war. You're a military. He's the commander. We fight for him spiritually. Please him whom you fight for and from whom you receive your wages. He will give you your wages if you fight the fight and finish the race. So how are we saved? By your deeds. Done in union with Christ, that God in his grace will then reward you even though you don't deserve it and he doesn't have to. Now watch. Watch here. Let none of you be found a deserter. Don't go AWOL, ab abandon the military. Let your baptism endure as your arms, your faith as your helmet, your love as your spear. See, your spiritual weapons. Not like Muslims, we don't behead people and rape their women. Your patience as a complete panoply. Watch here. Let your works be the charge assigned to you. The commander has assigned your duties, and your duties are obey him, do good works. Why? That you may receive a worthy recompense. That's not sola fide. You will be rewarded for your works. If you go AWOL, you lose your reward. In other words, no one saved, always saved. Be long-suffering, therefore, with one another in meekness as God is towards you. May I have joy for you forever. See, saying, don't desert the war. If you do, your reward is lost. You see? That's not one saved, always saved. That's endure till the end. Okay? Now we finish with Clement. Protestants, what are you going to do with Ignatius? What are you going to do with Polycarp? What are you going to do with their teaching? Don't you dare say I'm misinterpreting them, and don't you dare say they're wrong. If they got it wrong, no one will get it right, definitely not you. You become a Jehovah Witness, a Mormon, an Adventist, because that's what they say. The church became corrupt and apostate with the death of the last apostle, right? And then Christ had to then restore his church in the 19th century. Yeah, that's putting the cart before the horse, Dustin, because you think once saved, always saved. Don't read your view into their teaching. Are we ready now for Clement? And you want to see how dishonest, disgusting these Protestants are? Because they will misquote Clement. They don't quote what comes before and after. And they duped me when I was still not completely willing to let go of my Protestant shackles. And I still wanted to hold on to Protestantism, but I had become softened towards the Orthodox Catholic traditions. 
This passage was a breath of fresh air because I thought Clement taught sola fide because I trusted Jamila Muhammad White. I'm being honest. I thought he was a man of material. I could trust his scholarship. Thank the Lord he opened my eyes. Thank the Lord he opened my eyes. Thank the Lord for men of God, women of God who love the Lord, who then went and showed the context to show that I was being duped and deceived. Thank, I'm being honest. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you love me for the sake of the Lord, ask the Lord to give me the power to remain faithful and that I finish the race and I don't go AWOL. God forbid. Let me get something to drink. All right? Praise the Lord. We have another praise report. Look. Graduated seminary, was a pastor for years, and once saved, always saved, didn't sit well with me. I turned away the Lutheran church. Glory to God, brother. All right, Gary Lason. Oh, kudiasmu, kai hot, theasmu. Lord, I'm going to get back to Galatians 3, Christ being a curse, and Christmas in Luke this week, Lord willing. Here it is. Look what he does. Now, here's the article again. Sola Fide and Clement. Now, I'll tell you why this is devastating. Even a Protestant scholar like Michael F. Byrd admits that the tradition has always been that this was written by the Bishop of Rome, Clement. Michael Byrd is doing sessions series on his YouTube channel on the early church writers. And Michael Byrd was saying that the tradition was Clement of Rome wrote this letter. And he says, there's no reason to belie the tradition, right? That Clement wrote it because that was the testimony of the early church. This is a letter by Clement, the Bishop of Rome to the Corinthians. Now notice who he's writing to again. A church established by the apostle Paul. Why is he writing to them? Because they had ousted their elders. They had thrown out their elders, so the bishop of Rome is writing them to rebuke them to repent. You understand what the letter is? The bishop of Rome, Clement, is writing to the Corinthians, the church established by Paul, long after Paul had left and entered glory, rebuking them for ousting their godly elders, calling them to repentance. Thank the Holy Spirit, Michael, not me. Give glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yes, pray. All these videos are archived on my channel. Okay. Now, if it's true that it's Clement who wrote this, we got a problem, Houston. You guys listen to Lepanto. I want you to hear this. And there is no good reason to deny it. The tradition is clear early on. Everyone said that would mention the letter. Clement wrote this when he was the bishop. Now, you know why that's a shocking? Because this would be the same Clement. And the burden of proof is on the person to suggest otherwise. That Paul mentions in Philippians. In Philippians 4, 2 to 3, he mentions a Clement, which there is no good reason to deny, is the same Clement who was appointed bishop of Rome. <clears throat> Philippians 4, 2 to 3. Watch here. I urge Judea and I urge Sintiha, these are sisters in the Lord, fellow workers, <clears throat> to think the same way in the Lord. Indeed, I ask you also, genuine companion, help those women who have contended together alongside of me in the gospel with also Clement. And the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. He mentions a Clement. And he says, this Clement is a fellow worker of mine in advancing the kingdom of our Lord Jesus. And his name is written in the book of life. And there is no reason to suggest this isn't the same Clement who's a bishop of Rome who wrote first Clement. Man, this is your history. With also Clement and the rest of my fellow workers 
whose names are in the book of life. Philippians 4, 2 to 3, specifically verse 3. Yes, exactly, Dustin, Maya. Just be, pay, be focused and don't read your Protestantism into this. Now, here's the dishonesty. This is what they'll quote, but they won't quote to you the context. They quote chapter 32. They don't quote what's before and after because they're dishonest. Here's his letter you can read online. And if I just read that in isolation, you're going to say, wow, that sounds like sola fide. Wow. Yeah, Conan, don't, don't waste my time with that stupid argument. The thief on the cross. Say, okay, so don't go to church. Don't take Eucharist. Don't get baptized. Follow the hyper gracers. Please don't change the subject. This is a name mentioned that tells you when anyone who mentions a thief on the cross tells you they're Bible perverts. Okay, now watch here. Look what they quote. And when I heard it, like, wow, chapter 32. That's it, Sam. Clement was a Protestant. They're not going to say he's a Protestant, but you get it anyway. Daniela, I explained it by blotting you out from my live stream. Daniela, the way I'm going to explain how your name can be blotted out from the Book of Life is by blotting you out from my live stream. Let me change the subject, Daniela. Let me go off topic because Daniela needs an answer. That means you can lose salvation, which is what the church taught. <laughs> I like what she said. All right, here. Here's what they quote, crystals, and we'll be done. Thank God I, I only need to do one session. So bear with me. We're almost done. Thank you, Lord, for the numbers. May they increase for your glory. Chapter 32. We are justified not by our own works. You see, Martin Luther, he was a Clementinian. He followed Clementine. Clementine believed in Thola Fide. Clementine followed Thola Fide. But by faith. Now, whosoever will candidly consider each particular will recognize the greatness of the gifts which are given by him. For from him have sprung the priests and all the Levites who minister at the altar of God. From him also was the Son of our Lord Jesus Christ according to the flesh. Now watch here. We're almost done. By the way, Jeremy Wong, my mod, go to his YouTube channel, subscribe. He's now making clips. Of sessions like the archive, short clips of mine and others that will help you and benefit you, help him go viral for the glory of the Lord. Now watch. That's it. That's it. He see Sam Martin Luther was a Clementinian. Clement believed in Thola Fide, Clementine. And then he was an eyewitness to Paul. Yeehaw! Can I get in the man? Yeah, Ed. Bring Fred. Hey, Ted. Got a shiny head. What's up, Ted? Yeah, Fred. Stop it, Ned. All right, Ed. <laughs> Here you go. Let's continue. Dustin, you keep chiming in. I'm going to send you to Hamas, to the Valley of Hanam. From him arose kings, princes, and rulers of the race of Judah. Nor are his other tribes in small glory, and as much as God has promised, your seed shall be as the stars of heaven. All these, therefore, were highly honored and made great, not for their own sake. They were not made great because of their status or their ethnicity or their deeds or for their own works or for the righteousness which they wrought, but through the operation of his will. Here you go. Thola fide, mister. Thola fide. <laughs> You're going to have a field day with Thola fide. Here you go. Have some fun while we're... Roasting Protestantism. Thola fide, mister. And we too, being called by his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified by ourselves, not by our own wisdom or understanding or godliness or works which we have wrought in holiness. Of our See, we're not justified by works that we do in holiness and purity of heart. But by that faith, save Thola fide, through which from the beginning, Almighty God has justified all men. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see? Faith, not holiness done in pure heart. None of that. It's by faith. Sam, Sam, it's by faith. 
okay? Because I'm Assyrian, I-A-N, Assyrian, Ashurai. I'm not Armenian. I know you wanted me to be Armenian. You can't have everything. All right, but how? Oh, but however, look what I say in my article. Now watch here. You want to get shocked what they don't quote? And I quote to you the context. I promise you, you'll be so disgusted. When I quote to you the context, what they ignored before and after, you're going to be so angry. You're going to have to ask God to heal your heart for their deceit and ask God to prevent you from hating them because they are misleading people. So here's what I write. <clears throat> Reading this in isolation from the entire context of the epistle does seem to affirm that Clement, much like Martin Luther after him, held to sola fide. However, when one actually reads Clement in context, a totally <clears throat> different picture emerges, as the following quotations all show. Once again, all emphasis will be mine. Now, that was chapter 32. Now, Ad Cheldin, watch chapter 30. Now get ready to be angry at what they didn't quote. You're going to be very angry. I promise you. When you see this, you're going to say, wait, wait, wait. This is in chapter 30, before chapter 32? Yeah. And then what I quote afterwards. Get ready, Crystals. Lepanto, I hope you're here. Tell me how you feel when I show you this. Chapter 30. Let us do those things that please God. Now watch. And flee from those who he hates, that we may be blessed. Seeing, therefore, that we are the portion of the Holy One. Let us do all these things. Let us do. See, you're doing now. Let us do all these things to pertaining holiness, avoiding all evil speaking. May the Lord give us the power to practice what we preach and help me. All abominable and impure embraces, together with all drunkenness, avoid that. Seeking after change, all abominable lusts. May the Lord save us from lust and from sexual morality. To keep pure until marriage or until the Lord takes us. Detestable adultery and ex execrable, execrable, man, what is this word? And execrable pride. Ugh. Exercible. Exercible pride. For God says this in the scripture, resist the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now watch. This is chapter 30, right? Same letter. Look what they didn't quote. And get ready to be upset. You ready? Um, I swear you're going to be shocked. You're going to say, no way. There is no way they didn't quote this. Yeah. Jamila White never quotes this. Let us cleave then to those to whom grace has been given by God. See, the grace that God gave you, grace that God bestowed on you, not because you earned it. Now watch. Let us clothe ourselves with concord and humility. May we practice these, brethren. Now, don't forget, these are things that Christians were commanded to do. So let us seek them. Pray for me that we act on these. See, this is common saying, Christians, you got to do these things. In Jesus' name, may we practice what we preach. So it's not just head knowledge. Let us do the things he says and hate the things he says we're supposed to hate. Let us clothe ourselves with concord and humility. Ever exercise self-control. May the Lord help me overcome lust and gluttony and control my tongue and Love the Lord and hate sin. Standing far off from all whispering and evil speaking. Now watch. Lepon, let me know if you're here, brother, because I want to see your reaction. Being justified by our works and not our words. That's chapter 30 before chapter 32. But I'm going to tell you, that this justification is talking about salvation. It's not talking about being justified before men. Don't let them lie to you. He's not talking about justify. He's saying being justified by our works because God is looking. You better do these things or you won't be justified. He's not talking about justification as evidence before others. Okay. Oh, wait, it's going to get worse. For the scripture says, he that speaks much shall also hear much and answer. Right? In other words, he's not about you're going to be judged by God. It's not, not about before men. So don't let him lie to you. And there's more if you don't believe me. Because now chapter 31. <clears throat> and does he that is ready in speech. Let's see if I quoted the right part. Yep. And does he... 
that is ready in speech deem himself righteous? See, do you think that by your speech you're righteous? Blessed is he that is born of woman who lives but a short time, meaning your sins are few if you die young, but not given to much speaking. Don't talk too much. Let our praise be in God and not in ourselves. For God hates those that commend themselves. Do not boast how great you are, Jamila Muhammad White. Let's practice what we preach. Let testimony to our good deeds be borne by others. Let people praise you. Don't praise yourself. Let people say, look how Sam, he's so smart, as was in the case of our righteous forefathers. Boldness and arrogance and audacity belong to who? Jamila Muhammad White. Those that are cursed of God, but moderation, humility, and meekness to such as are blessed by him. Right? May we practice this. Now what? Chapter 31. You guys want proof that you're not justified by faith alone? That's not what he was saying? Chapter 31. Look. <clears throat> Let us see by what means we may obtain the divine blessing. Okay, watch here. It's all my article. Watch here. There you go. Thank you, G26. Keep praising me. Let us cleave then to his blessing. Hold on to his blessing. Don't let go. And consider what are the means of possessing it. You guys, listen. How do you possess his blessing? So you got to cling to it. That's something you do. You understand? Clinging, possessing means something you do. You need to do this. Cling to it. Okay? Let us think over the things which have taken place from the beginning. For what reason was our father Abraham blessed? Was it not because he wrought, did something, not just believed something? He did righteousness and truth through faith because he believed he did that which is righteous? Isaac, with perfect confidence, as if knowing what was to happen, cheerfully eat himself. As, see, they're doing things because of their belief. Their faith makes them do things. And the things they do because of their faith is what justifies them. <clears throat> right? Jacob, <clears throat> through reason of his brother, went forth. See, he did something. You see? They're doing something. They're acting. They're migrating. They're relocating. They're being willing to be killed from his own land and came to Lebanon and served him. And there was given to him the scepter of the 12 tribes of Israel. See? You see it's doing? Now, what about chapter 34? You still don't believe me that he does not teach sola fide if we read the context? You still don't believe me, right? Now, I got a lot to quote. I hope you don't mind. Do you mind? Because I want to finish it up here. Great is the reward of good works with God. Get, you get it? With God, guys. With God, not before men. Don't butcher this, Jamila Muhammad White. Great is the reward of God, good works. Great is your reward of good works with God. God will greatly reward you. Join together in harmony. Let us implore that reward from him. Let us ask him for that reward that we get from the good works we do. You ready? Here you go. Here you go. Tell me if this sounds like sola fide. Tell me if this sounds like sola fide. I won't read all of it, just the salient points. Okay. The good servant receives the bread of his labor. Do you guys caught it? The bread of his labor. Kev, the Shia follow your whore mother, not God's word. Kev, you're a whore and your mother's a whore. And the Shia follow your whore mother, not the word of God. Because you're a dog and you're a whore. Just live with it, man. You're, you're a whore. So is your mother. Ask the Shia. So stop going by your whore mother's word. Go by God's word. You wonder why I'm saying is because this whole, this bastard, this whore, whose mother doesn't know who fathered him. Okay. The good servant receives the bread of his labor. Pay attention, brethren. Crystals, are you seeing? Clement teaches justification as believed in the Orthodox Catholic Church. With confidence. See? You earn your bread by your deeds. The lazy, slothful, cannot look his employer in the face. Ah, so God is our employer. 
So you got to work to get your check. It is requisite, therefore, that we be prompt in the practice of well-doing for of him are all things. And thus he forewarns us. Behold, the Lord comes and his reward is before his face to render to every man according to his work. You just bury sola fide. Yes, Mr. Beans, it's necessary because you're a whore. And I got to remind you that you're a whore so you can remain humble. So you become a humble whore. Get the hell out of here, you filthy spiritual bastard. Go stuff some beans up your nose and flush Satan through your arse. Okay. And thus he forewarns us. Behold, the Lord comes and his reward is before his face to render to every man according to his work. Now, did everyone catch it? Crystals, everyone caught it? He just quoted scripture saying, the Lord is going to come to repay you for your labor. If you're lazy and slothful, you'll be ashamed before your employer. So be zealous to work because then he will come and give you the bread of your labor because you're justified by works in his sight. Ah. You caught it? So let me read. I won't read all of it, just the salient points, and then we got a few more paragraphs and we're done. That's it. Three early church writers, all of whom were disciples of the apostles, three eyewitnesses of the apostles, and all of them affirm that you are saved by grace, but that salvation is yours by your faithfulness in obeying the commands of our Lord. All three of them. None of them taught sola fide. Let us therefore, conscientiously gathering together in harmony, let us be one, Cry to him earnestly as with one mouth that we may be made partakers of his great and glorious promises. For the scripture says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which he has prepared for them that wait for him. Almost done. A few more minutes. Okay. Now I'm going to go to chapter 35 and then two more paragraphs and you're going to be blown away. Chapter 35, immense is the reward. How shall we obtain it? See, look, watch. He's telling you, how do you get the reward from God? How does God reward you with the immortality? That's the chapter, right? Now, I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to read the parts that I bolded. You'll see it. It's bold. Now, watch. How do we get it? Okay, here, how's, here's how we get it. Watch. How do we get this reward? Clement, here you go. If our understanding be fixed by faith towards God, if we earnestly seek the things which are pleasing and acceptable to him, if we do the things, if we earnestly seek, see, notice it's action, action, action. If we earnestly seek the things which are pleasing and acceptable to him, if we do the things which are in harmony, with his blameless will, if we do the things, Jamila Muhammad White, do, act, seek, these are all actions. And if we follow the way of truth, follow, seek, do, can he be any clearer? Casting away from us all unrighteousness and iniquity, along with all covetousness, strife, evil practices, deceit, whispering and evil speaking, all hatred of God, pride and haughtiness, Vainglory and ambition. We do all that, right? That's how you get rewarded. See? Still not convinced? All right. Chapter 41. And then I'm going to show you what he does with Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, which is quoted by Paul, which is butchered by people like Jamila and Muhammad White. And then we're done. Continuation of the same subject. Look what he says here. Okay, watch here. Get ready. And then watch what he does with Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, which is cited by Paul, butchered by Protestants like Jamila Muhammad White. Now, it won't allow me to put everything in because certain words. Let every one of you, brethren, give thanks to God in his own order, living in all good conscience, 
with becoming gravity and not going beyond the rule of the ministry prescribed to him. Don't go beyond the rule that God has commanded you to follow. Not in every place, brethren, are the daily sacrifices offered. Notice the Eucharist, not everywhere. Or the peace offerings, or the sin offerings, trust offerings, but in Jerusalem only. <clears throat> Likewise, even with the Eucharist, it's celebrated everywhere where there are Christians. And even they, even there, they are not offered in any place, but only at the altar before the temple, that which is offered being first carefully examined by thy priests and the ministers already mentioned. Those, therefore, who do anything beyond that which is agreeable to his will are punished with death. So he's threatening you. If you go against his will, you'll be punished with death. You see, brethren, that the greater the knowledge that has been vouchsafed to us, the greater also is the danger to which are exposed. The more you know, the more accountable you will be. Here it is. Let's see if we'll go through the more you know, well, let me put it through because of the word death. Let me remove death. It's not allowing me because it's a term. So the more you know his will, the greater your punishment. The more you know his will, the greater your punishment. Those, therefore, who do anything beyond that which is greater are punished with death. The more you know his will, the greater your punishment if you don't do his will. You see, brethren... That the greater the knowledge that has been vouchsafed to us, the greater also is the danger to which we are exposed. See? Now let's wrap it up here. We're done. Thank you for your patience. Now watch here what he does with this passage. Let me show you the passage he quotes so you can be blown away. Because this is quoted, misapplied by Protestants like Jimmy La White to show, see, it's faith alone, not works. Because they butcher what Paul says. So here's the passage. Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2. We're going to go out with a bang. Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2. We're going to go out with a bang. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Whose sin is covered. See this is David. Paul quotes it. And applies it to justification. And Protestants want to see. Sola fide. Watch what Clement is going to do with this passage. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity. You are blessed if God never holds you accountable for your sin. If God forgives your sin, doesn't hold you accountable, you are blessed. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. Paul quotes this in Romans 4, 7 to 8. But we're going to read Romans 4, 6 to 8. Romans 4, 6 to 8. Watch here. Guys, this is very important. Listen, and we're going to go out with a bang. It's very important. And we're done. Romans 4, 6 to 8. So also, Paul quotes this now. David pronounces a blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. See? God will make you righteous apart from the works you do. See? Sola fide. No, that's not what he means, but it's okay. I'm going to let Clement answer this. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not reckon a sin. You see, you trust in the Lord and God will never count your sins against you. Not the works you do. Sola fide. That's not what he means, but okay. Clement, what does he say? Look at, get ready to be shocked. Because Clement will quote Psalm 42. I'm sorry, Psalm 32. Verses 1 to 2. Watch here. You ready? Get, you want to see how Clement deals with this? Focus. Let us pray to be thought worthy of love. We're going to go out with a bang. Okay. Let's go out with a bang. Clement quotes Paul quoting Psalm 32. Clement quotes Psalm 32 verse 1 and 2. And who is Clement? A disciple of Paul. Mentioned by Paul as having his name in the book of life. Clement learned this from Paul. Pay attention, we're almost done. Clement learned this from Paul. Okay. Daniel, don't engage people because I'm going to send you out here, Daniel. You see, beloved, how great and wonderful a thing is love and that there is no declaring its perfection. The love of God is beyond comprehension. That's what he's saying. Who is fit to be found in it? Who is worthy to have this love of God? Pay attention. 
such as God has vouchsafed to render so. Who is fitting to have this love of God filling him? Let us pray, therefore, and implore of his mercy. Let us beg him for this mercy that we may live, there's the actions again, blameless in love, free from all human partialities for one above another, love each other equally. All the generations from Adam, even unto this day, have passed away. They die. But those who, through the grace of God, have been made perfect in love, that God has favored you to give you this love and perfect you in that love as you walk in it, now possess a place among the godly and shall be made manifest at the revelation of the kingdom of Christ. Now watch. Watch this. Paul cited Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, saying, the man who's justified without works is the man that God will not count sins against him. Clement, an eyewitness of Paul, mentioned by Paul, the bishop of Rome, Quotes the same passage. Now look what he says. You ready? You guys ready? This is the annihilation of Jamila White, Antonia Dodgers, and Protestantism. I'm not lying. We're going out with a bang, guys. It's over. After this, if you still want to debate me on Protestant, Dr. Solafide, you can go to hell. Book your ticket, first class, to the Valley of Hinnom. Because Gehenna comes from Hinnom. Go to hell, and I pray Hamas finds you and treats you nice. For it is written... Enter into your sinker chambers for a little time until my wrath and fury pass away. And I will remember a propitious day. You hide from my wrath that's poured out on unbelievers. And I remember the day in which I was made propitious towards you, meaning my anger removed from you and will raise you up out of your graves. So what removes God's anger towards us? Watch what he does, man. This is like, you got to be kidding me, Sam. Blessed are we, beloved, if we keep the commandments of God and the harmony of love. Let me repeat it twice. If we keep the commandments of God, I forgot the word of there, and the harmony of love, that so through love our sins may be forgiven us. One more time. If we keep the commandments of God, we are blessed. And if we keep the commands in love for God and one another, that so through love, our sins may be forgiven us, for it is written, and look what he quotes, blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not impute to him. Say what? In whose mouth there is no guile. What are you talking about? God will bless you and not count sin against you if you keep his commands in love. Clement? A disciple of Paul who learned from Paul, who used this passage in Romans to teach justification apart from works. This blessedness comes upon those who have been chosen by God through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You caught it? Here's the article. It's over. Clement. See, I was waiting for Lepanto. Polycarp, Ignatius. Three eyewitnesses of the apostles, trained by the apostles. Gave their life to Jesus, even unto death. Died as holy martyrs. I know that Justin Martyr, Ignatius, not just Martyr, Polycarp and Ignatius, who knew the scriptures, knew the theology, and none of them interpret Paul's statements to mean. They cite Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, quoted by Paul in Romans 4, 6 to 8. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, right? <clears throat> they cite these texts, and none of them conclude that it's sola fide. And these are eyewitnesses of the apostles. If they misunderstood the scriptures and the apostles, there's no hope for us. Because if the very eyewitnesses that the apostles trained, and whom the Holy Spirit appointed to be their successors, after they left the earth, whom the Holy Spirit energized to preserve scriptures, explain them, affirm them, defend the flock, and die for the faith. If they got it wrong, forget about Christianity. Go find you another religion. Here's the article. All you need is the apostolic. Now, let me explain why they're called apostolic fathers. Okay, let me explain, and we're done. 
We had a good crowd. We had over seven or close to eight. And glory to God, numbers in Greece, for the glory of the Lord, not for our praise. May I never whore myself and compromise for fame or status. And may the Lord keep me pure sexually and financially to glorify him even unto death, that I don't fall. Apostolic fathers, apostolic fathers mean those Christian authorities, writers, bishops, who were disciples of the apostles. That's why they're called apostolic fathers. The fathers of the church who were disciples of the apostles, eyewitnesses to the apostles, who wrote writings that are preserved. That would be Clement, First Clement, Polycarp, so Epistle to the Philippians, Ignatius and his letters, Epistle of Barnabas, there, and Didache. They're called the apostolic writings. Brethren, rewatch this, upload this, clip this, read the articles, share them. You owe it to the Lord to learn these facts, present them, share them with your children, your spouses, your siblings, your neighbors at church, inoculate them because once they know what justification is, they will not become Protestant. They won't. Unless they think, like Joe's Witnesses and Mormons and Adventists, that after the death of the apostle, all these men were corrupt and corrupted the church and the truth was lost. So the Lord had to then restore it in the 1800s. Blasphemy of blasphemies. Now pray for me, guys. Pray God will bring my daughters to me. Pray God will save me and I never succumb. Save me from lust from food addiction, from succumbing, never fall into scandal, love Jesus with perfect obedience, practice what I preach. My daughters grow up in love with the Lord. He grants us safety, security, protection, and health. I see them, brings them to me, removes Martin from their lives. The Lord provide financially. And I finish the race with integrity and pray the Lord show me. I have to travel 10 hours. I'll be in Modesto Turlock. Pray that I can get everything organized. I got to get around a car. I got to do all this stuff. Pray for me, man. I got to go. I got to say show respects to this guy's family. But Lord, I'll be back tomorrow if the Lord wills. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will return physically and bodily. May the blood of Christ cleanse us. The Spirit fill us. And the Spirit energizes us to submit to Him and love the Lord with perfect obedience and never shame the Lord. Save us from our flesh, from Satan the world. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, return and bring my daughters to me. And Theotokos. Pray for us. We love you, Mother. Please pray. The Lord preserve us. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Maranatha. See you soon, Lord willing.